So, Tim, how have you and the family been? We've been good. We've we've been good with uh, having a, a six year old and a three year old in the house. Life is is fairly um, ad hoc, shall we say? You just take every day as it comes. But mate, we're good. We're buzzing. Um, my wife's just got a new job, so she's flying. So yeah, we're in a we're in a good spot. Wow, well, mate. And before we get stuck into your rugby story, then Tim, where was home for you and who lived at home with you? Uh, what, during rugby, you mean? During just rugby, it was from a kid, mate. As a kid, just from a kid, it was St. Helens. Was it? Um, it was St. Helens with me, my mum and dad, and my sister. Um, okay. growing up in a in a very football family, really. Um, okay. my dad played football all his life and still is at the grand old age of I don't know what, how old he is now, but too old to be playing problem. football. That's yeah. that's for sure. Um, so yeah, it was all it was always football. Um. And St. Helens born and bred, although now I think even if you you know you talk to anyone, even my family, I think they think I'm from Witness anyway. <laughs> it's, yeah, you're it's... adopted, mate. There's no going back, is there? Oh yeah. once you're in, you once you're in, you, that's it. You you yeah. you're caught black and white in the blood. <laughs> so where did that competitive edge come from, mate? Did you get it with your sister or was it with your dad? Um I it was probably with my dad, yeah. um, and it was probably yeah, it was probably from my dad football wise. So this sounds silly, but you will. I feel like you you can support me on this one. I think it's being ginge as well. I think <laughs> because I'm growing up, sunset, me, mate. oh, I love that. I wish I'd have known that at school because that would have got me out of a ton of shit. Mine was always strawberry blonde. Yeah, um, you wouldn't believe it just... to see it now, but I was ginger. Right. And kids are kids. And yeah. it, it was like, I think that was just my way of, as a even really young kid, of like getting some status within the group. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, th- I think, you know, it sounds stupid, doesn't it? But like, that was, oh, I, I'm already behind the eight ball because I'm a ginger. Got to yeah. gotta get myself into the popular group. And I think, it, <laughs> I think, to some extent it came from that and then obviously you just thrive don't you and you start getting known within school and you get seen with the popular kids and it's all down to your sport and you just keep doing it I think that's probably where it came from um but it is I think it is in the family I think if you talk to my sister and you talk to particularly my cousins they will all say oh yeah you've you've got that gene you've got that competitive gene it's just just one of them things Right, mate, and and how did rugby be, become a part of your life? And where was so, the first So, so I, I didn't play amateur. I didn't play amateur oh, rugby. Okay. I um, I was literally asked to play at school, at yeah. high school. Um, they were like they were short, <laughs> they, and it right. was one of them. Like you're all right at footy. Do you reckon you can come and stand on the wing for us for a bit? and then as high school games happened people get hurt and I didn't know what I was doing so I ended up in the middle of the field and unbeknown to me there was a St. Helens scout there watching the game who spoke to the teacher after the game and said like I've not seen that lad before which (laughs) like no one had because I'd never played a game before (laughs) Um, can can you ask him if he'll come down um, and like try out for the what was like the town team then yeah. Um. So I went and did that, and kind of just then stayed within the ranks. Got took on into the like the uh, academy system, what it was then. Yeah. Um. Progressed through, and it was at the point of progressing up to, and this really is showing my age, up to the alliance system. Oh yeah. As it was, which was like the old school, like under twenty ones. Yeah. It was at that point that um, basically you had to be training three, four, five times a night. And I was coming up to going away to, or I had an offer to go away to university. I think the reality of the situation was I wasn't good enough anyway to go into the Alliance squad. Um, I played with uh, like John Sims, uh, Dave Fash, Steve Myler. um, And I I wasn't probably good enough to make that step, but it was was, uh, Dave Lyon at the time the coach who yeah. put it really politely and basically said look 
you're going away to university, if you're going away to university, I can't justify you with a contract because you won't be here. And it was put like that. And I went to university. Now, I went away and within a few weeks, John Myler had just set up or was starting, got involved within the Witness uh, Academy set up and basically rang me and said, look, I'm getting involved here. I've got some lads here. I know you from St. Helens. If I send you your training programs up to uni, I trust that you'll do them because I know you as a player and come back at the weekend for me and play. And that's what I did. Right. Um, and loved it. Loved it. He let me play a little bit of student rugby league. Um, so I um, could I went and toured Australia with them. Brilliant. Um, and ca- captain them, doing that. Um, had a great time. Uh, and then came to kind of the last week of exams. Honestly, and when I tell this story, people think it's like, I've you not know, like I'm bullshitting a little bit or I've added a bit, and but it genuinely wasn't. Last week of exams, morning of my last exam, I get a phone call off John. Uh, actually, like, I what are you what are you up to? What are you doing? I'm like, well, I've got my exam this afternoon, and then I'm 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 out on the ras like I'm I'm living yeah. it up. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't really want to be telling you, but that's what I'm doing. And he was like, yeah. No, you're not. Finish your exam get back here because you're training with the first team tomorrow and you're making your debut at Salford on on, on Sky at the weekend yeah. and that was it it was like yeah oh, alright <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'll do that <laughs> so and that 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 was how that that was it right well I won't lie mate I've got an array of questions just out of that little so Go for, for what town team system and service early and it was when it, like a yes. little bit after you won it mate once town team thing is that a system you'd like to see come back because I know it's in place Tim and it it's where they play internally but I, I still think Saints, Warrington, Wigan Oldham's they'd all be more than happy wouldn't they to have a 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 competing is that something I you'd like so. to see back I, I, I think so I, I mean the the experience of travelling and playing lads from different areas, you can't beat. And I know they get that to some extent on the, you know, within the Sunday League game. But yeah. the the standard that it, it picks you up to, it, it's phenomenal. And there is that sense from a very early age of like representing your town yeah. um, that, again, is the kind of the, the morals and the standards been ingrained from early on. Now, I do understand about not specialising kids too early. So, I, you know, I do see that argument, but I don't see any harm in kind of doing it almost festival style or or whatever, you, you know, one or two games. You pick them, you pick the best from an area, you go and do a couple of standalone festivals, town festivals yeah. and 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 instill it that way because I, I I like I got tons from it particularly because I haven't played an amateur background it kind yeah. of sped me up obviously but just like it's silly but like the prestige of it and and I do think there's something to be said about picking lads and letting yeah. them know like at the minute you're doing really well and you're going to represent your town because of that yeah. That doesn't mean you're going to be in any system to be fast tracked up to be a professional. That means this year on this day, you're representing your town because that yeah. will stay with the kid forever. Like you'll know, oh, like the lads we were talking yeah, about yeah. before. Like yeah. um, I train, uh, not not very recently because of my neck, but down at CrossFit Faction in Witness, yeah. and and the head coach there, Dan Connolly, like. Yeah. He, you start talking about rugby, and he will always go back to oh, when I played town team and when I did that. Like it's mad, like you know, yeah, straight away back like there, aren't you? And it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Yeah, I love it. No, I'm the same, mate. When I bump into like the lads we mentioned before, and that, and and others we've not mentioned, like Roger comes up, yeah, because of, that, because of how dominant he was at that time, and the the, the discipline. That he instilled the running up St Mike's yeah. golf course. All town team memories, really. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm in my mid thirties, and it's still something you talk about. And it was you were eleven and twelve. Like, and if it, you're talking kicking. about it, how yeah. much of it has 
dictated the way you are as a person and and the standards that you live as a person. You know what I mean? Like you subconsciously and all that. Yeah, yeah. Another thing, then, mate. Leadership is that something you've ever like been around? Did you do you think you're born with that, or can you develop that as well? Um, I think you can develop it. Yeah. Um, had I been around it, I, I I've got I've got personally got a big belief in that. Like, a lot of people talk a very good game, not very few follow it through. And so I think leadership is one of those things that actually you just demonstrate and you just do by having your standards and then you realise other people follow you and and, and go with yeah. you. When I was, I mean, kind of briefly mentioned him, but like John Myler for me was, and I've mentioned him on, on other places and other things, like he was the one that instilled that leadership in me. Now, he was firm and he had, it was his way. But he would always follow his way as well. He was never late for training, ever. Yeah. He was always clinical with everything he delivered. And, and it and it bred then through the team to the point that I don't think there was ever one team within, like particularly within that St. Helens setup and then within the Witness setup, that there wasn't ever like one leader we were like, a gang of if yeah. if you got given a shirt, you knew you had to represent and be a leader for everyone else on the field, and that that was kind of the way it was. Um. So yeah, and it's funny, like leadership is one of those for me. Like it's, um, I think when you say leadership, you always think of one person being a top dog, and you you know if it's in within a business, you think it's the the owner of the business. I would like to think anyone I've worked with has felt that I was a leader for them. Yeah. But I've never been a top dog. Do you know what I mean? But hopefully I've the way I've kind of managed myself playing and training and being meticulous there and then going into like all the other roles I did within Witness, even down to the kit man, like it was it was meticulous and it was done and people were seeing all that. If I'm ever in a position like that, where I have to get a kit ready for a team, I'll always do it the way Sherlock did it because that was the way to do it. So yeah, that, that's my, that's what I would like to think. Whether that's true is another question, but that's what I'd like to think. It's a collective, it's a collective like uh, buy-in mate, isn't it? It, It's a key, key buy-in like that. Yeah. If there is a top dog, he doesn't work without his generals. Who they don't work without the disciples. Did he? Like everybody's got a role to play. It's just whether you, you're wild or you, you're a performer, isn't it? That's it. It's about it. it's and, me, yeah. Like there was always a top dog in the team, as in, like the alpha player and the most talented player and all of that. Of which I was never. <laughs> but we all there. There wasn't that that hierarchy it was like you you will all do your job to the best of your ability some worse than others but you would all do it and <laughs> it's why you, know, you were well. doing it yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so yeah and you think not coming up not being brought up with the game from such an early age and being exposed probably mid-teens would you say Tim yeah yeah yes. think that benefited yeah so even later so really you didn't have like you, it's not a worry. So I'll so I growing up, lads know other lads, don't they? From other teams, you don't think I have to be worried of them. You had a free license to express yourself, not knowing if number eight was gonna whack you or number yeah. two was gonna tap you. Does that make sense? So and I've yeah, I've got a funny story about this actually. So I've and still to this day, and it's, it gets ever more prominent the more bald I get. I've got a massive or oh, a fairly big scar on the back of my head from one of the first couple of games I played for the town team against this Leeds team. And we've gone and they're all on the bus leading up to it. The other lads are name dropping these players and talking about, oh, we need to watch for him and we need to do this. We need to do this. Anyway, I've it's it, it completely going over my head. I've got, I ain't got a clue. I'm more like shit, you know, shitting myself that oh no, oh no, I'm gonna play a game. I'm gonna uh, all of that jazz. <laughs> whatever. Anyway, within 
the first 20 minutes, I take this ball in, I run straight at my opposite number in the centre. He picks me up, slams me. I come up, my head's bleeding everywhere. I've got to come off the field. Head gets stitched. I go back on. After the game, and like everyone said, like, fair play, I can't believe you did that good on you. After the game, they all come up to me and go, why was your first carry at Chev Walker? He's the biggest name in the game at our age, and you ran straight at him. I was like, someone could have given me a tip up at some That's point yeah. because before <laughs> I did it, it was no wonder he royally abused me. Um, <laughs> but so, yeah, like kind of going on what you said, yes, it did kind of take away some of that, the fear factor a little bit, but it could have probably saved me a few wounds as well along <laughs> the way. But, um, yeah. But yeah, and I also think that I, I kind of, I would like to think again that I saw the game differently um, because I looked at it from a footballer point yeah. of view. So, um, yeah, I could, uh, space and things were very apparent to me and there was a big learning curve, you know, like the first time you put the, your foot on a ball when it's on yeah. the third tackle and everyone goes, what the, are you doing? <laughs> But it, yeah. you know, it allows you to explore, doesn't it? Um, yeah. And you're coming in it, at that time as well, aren't you? You're fresh, you're fresh, you're raw. Like yeah. you are literally just seeing what you can do, aren't you? That's it. That's it. And the, that was the beauty of like that age that lads were. You know, you could play and 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 have a go and work out what was wrong and what was right. It was, and that that back to that system, that town team system. Because you were always a, a decent caliber at training and things, you could yeah. get a good gauge of what you could do. But then I mentioned there, like when I then went back to play uni, like people would think there was. Uh, so when I went away, I went with uh, Jermaine Coleman and Matty Blaymeyer, uh, Richie Barnett. They were all in that same squad that went. And we were like, we were walking on water against these other students. Do you know what I mean? Because, like, the standard that we were playing at every week, we then went and it's like, you know, you just go step down a level. It was like all this space, all this these trick kick plays, and, mate, I loved it. Because Learning ground. then you were allowed to use that flair a little bit and then, oh, well, I can actually pull that off consistently at this level. I'll, when I go back, I can yeah. I can try that. So, yeah, it was good. And uh, we'll go back a little bit again, mate, if that's all right. And how was yeah. school for young Tim and, and what, what were your interests in that at school? Uh, my interests at school were football yeah. and football and football. Uh, so I, you I, I'm, I'm a scouser, I'm a Liverpool. Oh, yeah. Um, um, I, yeah, it, so, I, and it's not to say, like, I was all right at school as well. I did, you know, I did okay at school, but, it, I just never wanted to be there. I, I, I would regularly be trying to get out of going. Would we? Uh, so I lived in St. Helens and went to school in Rainford. So obviously I had to catch the bus every morning. My mate that I would always catch the bus with lived at the very top of the road. We consistently ended up walking from St. Helens to Rainford because we pretended we'd missed the bus just to walk for two and a half hours to get there. Like it, it, we just did. I just didn't. I just didn't enjoy school at all. Yeah. Um, it, but then when we kind of getting into the high school and the sports kind of kicking, that you know that helped me massively. But all of my friends were, uh, you know, with the sport orientated group. The group that I'm still very friendly with now are all the lads that played the sport. Um, yeah, it just it, you know float some people's boats and it doesn't others and it, it just it just didn't mind. It, I just didn't want to be there. I'd rather be on a field with a ball. Was it more social than Tim? Yeah, mate. Just a chance to see mates and that in it. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean even you know, even the social side of it, I didn't want to go. I hated yeah. it. Like I hated school with a passion. Like it'd be like, yeah, I know my mate to go in and yeah, it'll be nice to see him. But don't want to go. Sunday. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Like, 
I don't want to go. And I know that they'll come training tonight. So I'll see him when I get there. Like, it was like, it, it's bad. Um, and I don't know where that came from, to be fair. I just, I think, yeah, I just, I just love playing sport. I love being around sport. I love the banter of sport and, you know, the crack that lads have. And you can't do that in school, can you? Oh, Not quite the same. <laughs> so, do you know the characteristics I'm hearing from previous guests, which I mentioned a few names to you off know, for? It's like yeah. the likes of Gil, the likes of uh, Big Phil Joseph and people like that, mate. Where did them attributes from yours come from then? If they weren't developed at school and you had like a small immediate family at home, because you were caring, you went out your way for people, not just the players, but families. You were like everybody's go to. You you were like caring is the key word, mate. And and you facilitated as much as you could for the domestic and the foreign players. And I'm sure we'll touch on it later. But where does where does this side of Tim come from? If you would be reluctant to mix at school and stuff. Yeah, I think it's the the team environment. I mean, when you're in a a team sport, you need everyone else to to thrive, don't you, and succeed. Yeah. And I would, you know, I always we would always stay behind after training and help lads. And I'm talking now, like when I'm back in my football days, you'd always stay behind and help. Where did that that I don't know that care inside come from. I, I, I can only think family. Um, from an from an early age, but I, I don't know. It's just always been there. If, and I think it's more like a, uh, like a problem solving kind of aspect. If someone comes to me and says, "Mate, I'm in trouble." Yeah, I'm like my head's gone. Like I'm like right, let's play out all these options here and let's see how we can get you through this and sort it out. I think it it's that, I buzz off that, like, problem there's solving. a problem, we've got to solve it, and now, actually, the guy that I've helped solve it is, you know, is is thriving and buzzing and, and kicking on now and he's happy. And I, I think it, it it's that, that buzz of helping someone that I get where it comes from. I don't know. Um... But I also have a big, I mean, you said about overseas players and, and domestic players, etc. My my big thing was that everyone's an equal as well. So yeah. as much as um, some of the, the, the Australians and New Zealanders, etc. may have got the big money, when you come in and the way I deal with you, I'm not going to deal with you any different than I do the 15 year old that's just stepped up into the first team and just got his shot. But then on the flip side, we also need to understand like, um, you, you remember Corey Thompson. Yeah. The first, so Corey Thompson came over here and he won't mind me telling you this story because I've told it many a time, just not publicly. Um, he came over when it was like the dead of winter. So we'd managed to get him a car, managed to get his house sorted flying you get a call this one morning Sherlock you're going to have to help me what's up mate well I can't drive my car why Corey what's up well I can't see out the window I was like yeah it's iced up <laughs> yeah what do I do well, I you've, like, never you've, me, you've, yeah. got a, you've got to defrost your car he was like Sherlock I've never seen ice before what do I do how do I get my car ready I've got to be at training in half an hour so it's like having to, so you've got, I so you know, yes, you deal with everyone the same, but then next time another Australian comes over here for the first time and it's the first cold winter morning, I'll be on the phone at half six to him saying, mate, have you been outside and checked your car? Do you know what you, you do to get it going? And it sounds silly and people used to call it like, uh, like why are you spoon feeding and hand holding the players? It wasn't that. It never was that. It was you only know what you know. And yeah, if you've never experienced shock, something, it's a culture shock. And when you're over here for the first time, that's a silly question. And you probably know it's a silly question to ask someone. So you probably don't ask it. So at that point, you then pour boiling water on your windscreen, you crack your windscreen. And whereas if someone's already preempting it and coming forward with the information, it's like, oh my God, that's a godsend. I didn't know. Do you know what I mean? So 
and that's the same, you know, international domestic players. But it, that buzz back to where we were. I know I went off on a tangent there, but that buzz oh, yeah. of like helping them and knowing that I'd done something that they actually genuinely benefited from and appreciated was the buzz. But I, you know, where that was instilled from, I don't know. Do you introduce into tracky bottom ten instead of the flip flops <laughs> and shorts, mate? <laughs> oh, mate. Trying what to a get sign that was as well, you know. Oh, what a sign, he? oh yeah. He was he was special. He yeah, was he was special. Funny. And then kicked on when he went back to Oz, didn't he? He went to West West, I think he went, didn't he? And kicked on there, like, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, he was mega. An absolute well, yeah. Sorry, so that so like that and that story there, it's funny in it because it's just bizarre to us. But he could have been Panicking, getting a little bit anxious about it, and it, like you said, it's it's a new club. He wants to probably set a precedent, doesn't he? And he, he's flapping, but it's it's the difference you've made to him, isn't it? It's not, yeah. it's not, a, it's huge because I know you used to go and do some people shopping, mate, didn't you? And stuff like that. It's like it's the difference it makes. What we deem everyday life was a massive problem in that ten minutes to Corey. That, when, that's it. Yeah, when it's the unknown, mate, it's frightening. It is. And, you know, we, because uh, the other one that stands out to me, and I know the story in the path didn't end well at all, but Anthony Watts, when he yeah. first came over, uh, we were actually away. Uh, I think we were in Cumbria. It, but we'd gone away pre season somewhere and we'd gone overnight, and it had just so happened. I think his flight had got delayed which had meant he, you know, no one was around at the club. So I can't remember who it was that actually went, but we got one of the, like, supporters who was, like, did a lot at the club to go and pick him up and then go and drop him off at his flat in the middle of Runcorn. All the decks. So, yeah, so they went and picked him picked him up from Manchester Airport, took him to the decks, dropped him off there and then said, right, like, and I'm not knocking anyone that's done this, by the way. This I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, just yeah. kind of building a picture. Right, there you go, uh, Watto. Like, uh, this is yeah. what I've been told to do. I've left you here now. See you later. We were away. Yeah. And I, I'd like, I was going out of my mind, like I've got this lad that's come over from Australia and had come over in a bit of a cloud anyway. Yeah. And he's just been dropped off at the decks in the middle of run call all, all on his own. Uh, so mini I'm, I'm a ringing day. him by the <laughs> minute, trying to get hold of him. Anyway, uh, I spoke to him during the night. We spoke to him the next morning, and I was like, "Right, mate, I'm gonna, I'm coming back. We're on our way back from Cumbria now. I'm gonna come straight round. I'll get you a training kit, and then I'll get you into the club, and I'll do your introduction." And as I'm about to put the phone down, he goes, "Mate, how good is this place?" I was like, "What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean?" <laughs> he was like. Oh mate, I went out around Runcorn last night, and all the locals were helping me out. I was like, "Oh my <laughs> word, oh, no!" And he, he, yeah, took himself out into every pub in Runcorn and got free drinks all night just on his name. But yeah, it, it's funny how how you deal with it. But you you're right; these lads come over, they might get paid mega money, but they've never been onto this side of the world. Yeah, and so it's it's very different. As it would be for us going over there, do you know what exactly. I mean? So, um, yeah, I did. I would always try and think ahead as to mainly because I'm a bit of a warrior as well. So I like if I'm in Corey Thompson's shoes going out to my car and it's iced, I'm panicking. I'm not ringing anyone, but I would love if someone actually rang me and preempted it and tried to solve it first. And that's what I always tried to do. Best I could jump ahead of the bus. No, it is well, it's smart, isn't it? But so it, and if they have been here, mate, they've been to, they've been on tour, which is fetch me, carry me, provide everything's done and agenda and routine, isn't it? Times are set. Be here for that. Brecky's here. Dinner's there. You get two hours to go and do something. But a lot of them don't, do they? Because they don't really know the area. They'll stay pretty immediate to wherever they're staying, won't they? So, yeah. Yeah. So and. Uh, that's a skill that I think they don't get taught on the other side. Very like the military lads don't. Yeah. You live a life that's regimented. You turn up for eight o'clock, you're fed, 
you go out on the training field, you get your training kit, you get your then you get your dinner, then you get this, then you get told you're in a workshop in the afternoon. And then after that, you then go for, you know, coffee or feed with the lads. Then you go back, you sleep and you get up and you're told what to do. When that sport's not there, it's unreal. Like we all know what happened with our lives with COVID when, you know, your work schedule got thrown out the window and you were just told you were working from home and suddenly the house was upside down, work was appalling. And because you didn't have that regimented life structure, these players are going out of sport into the big wide world and having to almost fend for themselves. And I do say it and I know it sounds melodramatic, but it's it that simple skill is so difficult to teach someone that's always been told where to go and where to be and what to do. And it and it it is something that I think sport in general could get better at. Yeah. Hence why content is pointing current players into transitioning earlier, isn't it? Which I was going to say, like you're doing the the un, unknown, undervalued stuff from people that don't know, that now social media could do half the job for you. It weren't about them, mate, was it? Or it weren't as prominent content, weren't as uh, behind the scenes and real as it is now? No, no. And it wasn't as accessible. Like everything now is, is google or YouTubeable, isn't it? Like, um, I I remember like there's so many stories. Like lads, lads getting the tax, lads getting paid. So they've they've signed the contract. They get the first wage bill, and they've come up to me, yo yo Sherlock, what's the crack here? And I'm like, what do you mean? Well, and I'm making these figures up now, but I should be getting four grand a month, right? Well, I've not. I've only got like three three thousand one hundred. Like, yeah. yeah, let me see your let me see your, your pay slip. Yeah, yeah, that's your tax, mate. Whoa, whoa, what's the tax for? I'm like, well, it goes to government and it like pays for like your NHS and it pays for this and it pays for that. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to use any of those services. How do I opt out of it? Like, no, 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 there ain't no opting in and out. Like, that's what happens in the whoa. Nah, I didn't nah I didn't sign up. And they would have stand up rows with me like it was the club taking the money off them. And it yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, and it, I do by no means do I say this, you know, derogatory in any way, but like those little simple things, those like from when you're moving over are like huge. Then put that into someone who then transitions out of sport or develops out of sport and goes to do another and sets up their own business and then has to do their own tax return. And whoa, like now we're in a world of bother. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. luckily, like you say, you know, things are moving on. I think rugby league cares do a lot now, particularly for the rugby league lads um, around that. And the likes of, you've mentioned him already, the likes of Gil, have learned from their experiences and know what help players need and they're now going into doing things for after their playing careers that will help with that kind of financial planning, et cetera, et cetera. So, yes, it is getting better. Um, but I think, like you said there, the, the softer skills are still forgotten about. Like, they need to be able to manage money, yeah. But... They also know how to need to get up at eight o'clock when they don't have to get up at eight o'clock. But if they get up at eight o'clock, they can structure the day. They can live a more fulfilled life than actually going, I don't know what I want to do. And yeah, just getting up and going out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and just, just getting on with life as opposed to actually living it and thriving in it. But yeah, I get off my soapbox because it, it, no, it, it, no, it is one that, that is, yeah. We definitely think... overlook it, mate. I wouldn't like, so I get the I get the car stuff and I get like you know when you said the the fans with them off in the middle of run corner and all what he wasn't shy of having a pint and that was he yeah, so he was always gonna get on but not everyone's like what's he are they so yeah. like and especially if say you're a top four flat and like it might be no one living next door or whatever like telly's different channels whatever then like. You don't know where your boiler is, for instance, or whatever, because you don't know whether you're pre-setted up. Because you'll have a lot going on, mate. You know, you've got like a team bonding thing going on. There'll be more than what's he coming in getting signed. 
you're probably talking to players throughout the year, not just in the transfer window sort of areas yeah. like yeah. So it is. It's it's stuff that I think other fans will feel the same. I wouldn't have thought I'd attack stuff and that, but I definitely no. thought about the shopping and stuff after what I've heard about you. It's yeah. It's my like even down to you know we've had we had players um, that were coming over that we like you say we're in the like coming to the end of one year and you knew they were coming the next year. They were big names. They were from ours. So to my head, they've they've got accustomed to a certain standard of living. So when they come over to witness, well, we need not necessarily, it's not our duty to keep their standard of living, but it's their, you know, it's our duty to make them feel comfortable. So that means that when they come, the house is here, it's ready, it's clean. It's sorted. So I would like regularly be going viewing houses and like WhatsApp, you know, taking videos and sending them and then fitting it with furniture and doing it on a shoestring to make sure that it came in the club's budget. But at the same time, that player would come over to a sofa, a telly that had Sky so that he could watch the Aussie games internet. You, you know, like little things. And then like even now Things have moved on a lot, I know, but particularly when I first started doing it, it was like, it was a real, oh my God, you're thinking about doing that for him? Why would you, he, you know, he's a grown man, you know? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, but it means a lot for the buy-in then to the club and to like the group if he feels like people have already got his back when he when he first arrives. Um, I'm happy players are better for you than he show. A hundred percent. But, and and on the flip side, you know, that that's the like the the soft side. You've also got lads as men, as human beings, we all do. Some of us struggle mentally anyway. Mm. Then get thrust into a a foreign country on your own. And I can remember one with with one player who um, his his wife wasn't living in the country. And I was driving home. <clears throat> I'd had some meeting in Leeds. And while I was in the meeting, my phone was going off constantly. <clears throat> and I was like, it was his girlfriend who I'd never really spoken to. Yeah. I hear you all right, what's up? You need to get around. I'm worried about him. He's acting weird. And he's, you know, he's now not answering my calls. He's just been shouting down the phone at me. I'm really worried about him. And you know, I had to then tail it back from witness, uh, back from Leeds to to witness, kick this lad's door down yeah. to get in and sleep on his floor all night with him. And no one will ever know who it was. No one will. No one ever has to know who it was. I know, and he knows, and I know that it helped him massively. But at the same time there are so many other players like that. And if you don't have that relationship by going around, it wasn't the same player, but going fitting his house out and seeing his wife and taking the kids to school occasionally, she doesn't ever feel comfortable enough to make that phone call to me. And then who knows what happens that night? Do you know what I mean? So for all it did feel, you know, to some people like I was spoon feeding and hand holding to me, I always had the trust of every player in, in, you know, that in my care, and I valued that as though they were my own children. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like there was, there was, well, there's one famous incident. If you ever get the right group of players together about a night out when they went to Liverpool, that I got called in and there was all sorts of conversations right. having to be had with all sorts of different people. But yeah. again, those conversations only come if they trust you. And so for all at the time, it's like, oh, my God, what have they done now? I actually feel quite honoured and quite appreciate like appreciate the fact that even though I wasn't a player, I wasn't yeah. in the playing group. And often that, you know, what's, we keep everything away from the coaches. They don't need to know because if we'll get in trouble. I was always, I always sat in between that. And that's something that I, I loved back to, you know, helping people out and problem solving. But that you only develop that trust by going that extra mile for people sometimes, don't you? 
Could you not have done it further away, shitting on your own doorstep? <laughs> Mate, trust me. Trust me. They got <laughs> told. Do. They got told after. They got told after. But, yeah. But, I mean... and It's priceless, that, man. Yeah, and there's, you know, there's a lot of, you know, it happens to all other clubs and there's people that fix things and tidy it up and all that jazz. And I'm not saying I'm special in that sense. What I'm saying is that I felt I was in a special position in that I sat in between the two because that level of trust, knowing that someone else, because as much as I was doing that for them, I also knew that if I needed a, you know, a, a Holton Hornets ring us last minute because they need a presentation. I know I can pick up the phone and go, mate, I know you, you've got a day off today, but I just need you to just yeah. call down to the Hornets. And they do it at a drop of a hat because it, that was the, the relationship we had and that, you know, that that's what, that's what I buzzed off. Brilliant, mate. And like I said, we'll touch on a little bit more later, but, as, as, so as you're going through your school, mate, and, and football and Liverpool, are, are you passionate at this point, aren't they? What's, what's football like as a team sport? Is it clicky? Is it quite open? Because rugby, I felt rugby, both called for me, but more rugby league was very open and non-judgmental. And we tend to be from council estates, really, don't we? And we all got similar upbringings. How did you find that environment growing up playing football? Yeah, exactly the same, to be fair. And I think that's probably why, kind of, when I got a, a, a foot in the door of the rugby league, it, it was, like, seamless for me because the two <clears throat> sports were very similar to me in that sense. You you turned up at training, whether you, you'd been there, you know, three years or you'd been there a week, you had the piss ripped out of you, you got on, you played, and then you went home and turned up next week and it and you know no one cared where you where you went home to you just you just as long as you were here you you're part of the group and we'll rip the piss out of you and that and that was the same within rugby league um it, it, yeah i was never um i only ever really played at town level football i was never ever you know decent enough to kick on so i don't know you know, up the yeah. the standard, what whether that changes. Um but even like to this day, if I if I do go out and around in St. Helens, there'll be lads that I've either played with or played against that you still see and still go up and say hello and it's yeah. you know, do you remember when you kick lumps out of, out of my shins down down <laughs> in night? Yeah, well I've still got the scar to to prove it. But yeah, yeah. And so and like I say, that I loved. I they like they were the best days. Yeah, growing up, like just doing that, and and then picking on the older, you know, like st- sitting on the sidelines waiting to train and giving it the older lads and mm. having them chase you off the the back of the playing field because they're about to kick your head in and all that jazz. It was you like, were probably yeah. quick. I couldn't afford to do that. I was a little chub, mate. <laughs> well, yeah. I, w- I was quick until I remember one we played one uh, one footy game and I stupidly thought that being on the field meant that I was completely protected from the opposition's coach who I gave a mouthful to and at the end of the game he wheeled he drove his white van onto the car park blocked the car park from me running off and opened his door and said to these six lads that he had just played against me yeah. right lads go and teach him what not to say to me it's like oh shit uh, there's my <laughs> lesson learned <laughs> so when when you start playing rugby league then mate and you've gone from you're still semi a novice aren't you you've just been recognised for raw talent positional wise was was centre where you come you come through at or did you, was you versatile no, to be fair, it was I was versatile, but I was a winger, a centre, or a fullback. That that's they were the kind of the three positions. Um, I played with a guy, a lad called Liam Williams at St. Helens when I came through. Uh, Scouse was his nickname because he was a scouser, believe it or not. Um, and he was always <laughs> he was always the first choice fullback because he was he was lightning lightning on his feet and twinkle toes. Um, so he was always first choice there. So I was either on the wing or in the centre. I think the day 
Chev Walker handed it to me. They realised I wasn't the biggest to go <laughs> up against him. But yeah. Um, but I always, as as every player does, had a thriving to be in the halves and play in the halves. But you know, I had the likes of Stephen Myler, which I ain't gonna get a, a shirt over him though. So yeah, back back to the old talent and knowing your knowing your role. Yeah, well, there's no wrong with that, mate. Is then nothing wrong That's with it. that. So as a kid, mate, in them three positions, was you was, did you ever see the game differently? Did you find avid ways of attacking when to pick you? So I imagine hitting a line from fullback is very different from centre and wing, isn't it, mate? So how did you find each role? Yeah, so I uh, sent this the, the fullback and winger kind of hitting the line, ball retreat you know very similar i always um i i, I actually preferred playing in the center because i preferred defending in the center i think defending in the center for me certainly was easier than defending on the wing and i know you know to many people that probably haven't played the game that much think well you've only got one man to mark really you're your winger you've not got anything else to pay attention to but knowing when to jam when to stay out, when to keep the width of the line, when to jam the line in, when to retreat for a kick, or whether you should be staying in the line in case they throw the ball wide. All of that is, you know, particularly to a lad who, as we've said, hadn't played amateur. So, yeah. you know, well, it's dead easy. You're on the wing, so on fifth tackle, you drop back. All right, well, I'll, I'll drop back. And I can remember because they did it and it, this burns me to the day, and I have told him he, he did this to me. Um, Phil Clark, it was so when I was coming through, they used to do they used to put a, a academy game on Sky every week, right? And we played at Castleford, and you drop back on fifth tackle, don't you? So yeah. I drop back on fifth tackle, first first play of the game, it was first set of the game, and cast through the ball wide, and they scored a try down my side because. I'd drop back because before the game, everyone had been telling me they'll kick the 40-20. They're really good at kicking 40-20. That cast field, quite short, they'll kick a 40-20. Beware of that. If you get a 40-20 against you, like you've had a nightmare today. So I went back. They're not getting this 40-20. Threw the ball wide, scored. Right. Brilliant. Phil Clark on the commentary. Oh, dreadful decision there to drop back. Right. Brilliant. Next set. I stay up because they've just thrown the ball wide on me. What do they do? Kick a 40-20. Oh, he's funny. And I legged it back because I was like rabbit in the headlights. And I've tried to bat this ball back into the field of play. Got myself all mixed up, like tripped up, fallen over. I've ended up knocking the ball out of play because I'm that like mortified. Phil Clark, yeah. commentary. He's having a nightmare, this kid on the wing. Why? <laughs> After the after, like when I watched it back and all my mates in school, like, oh yeah, you're telling us to watch it on the telly and all the commentary is the same as you're having a nightmare. It's like, yeah, I know. So, but it emphasizes the point that 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 decision. Yeah. Uh but full back I love because of the freedom. Yeah. Um, particularly defending and attacking, knowing where you can slip into a line. Um when I like lucky enough, I played with Peach, David Peachy. Witness and like the stuff. Well, to be fair, I did all right. So I played with Peachy, uh, Paul Aitchison, and yeah, Jules O'Neill. Yeah, yeah, and and Jules O'Neill. And to be fair, I think that for all I hadn't had an amateur background, I got a huge, massive amount of learning in those couple of years off them three because. Oh, and Sprogger, to be fair. I was going to say, you played um, with Sprogger. Yeah. And, and Sprogger. So I didn't play with Sprogger. Sprogger was actually on the coaching staff oh, when I yeah. when I was in the first team. So, like, yeah, my, the wealth of knowledge of what to learn. So, I, I, I like, fullback was my position that I loved. Um, I think if I'd have ever progressed and got old and grey playing, I'd have moved into the centre and been quite content there. Right. And... So you're talking about like the the errors there, which it's I'd class that as a forced error though, because the forty twenty is gonna gonna make it anyway, and it makes so you've you've yeah. tried anything to not right. How do you how did you used to go about as a young lad 
not backing an error up with an error. Could you leave an error behind or would it stay with you for a bit? No, when I first started, no, I couldn't. Yeah. I couldn't. I, it would just play and play and play in my head, which it was that fear factor. And uh, so I always, initially when I started playing, played under fear. Um, and I think to some of that extent, because John Marlow had such high standards and, it, and and like he was ahead of his game in terms of academy setup because everything was static. You'd get the stats after the game and, and see. And I got wrapped up in that until one day when he he basically said, ultimately, this is a piece of paper and this piece of paper is just here to help you get better. What I'm bothered about is how you're playing on the field and I want you to enjoy it. And once I'd kind of got that green light off the man that I was fearing letting down, it was fine then. And I could let it go and I could just put it back to... Because I never, like, particularly playing football, made an error, made an error, because I knew I'd, I'd back it up two minutes later by doing something. You know what I mean? It was, But I think it was because... I hadn't had that grounding in rugby league. I was still learning every time I played. And so in my head, well, yeah, I've made that error, but I didn't know, or I've never done that before. Or, but yeah. that doesn't matter when you've got 12 blokes that want to win the game and you've just turned the ball over. And it, that bit, that like, I mean, you're linking it all in, like I'm linking it all in here to like that people pleasing and keeping everyone happy. Like I wanted my team to be happy and I'm letting them down. Yeah. But it did take some time to just realise, well, actually, I'm going to let them down more often if I'm playing under fear. And you've got to let it go. And you've got to just accept that they will, you know, accidents happen and mistakes happen. And, you know, young lads now, when you watch the game, a fella will get man of the match. But in the first two minutes of the game, he's dropped a howler and they've scored a try off it. But then what he's done for the rest of the game is meant he's got man of the match. So they, you know, it happens, we're human, and it's how you respond to it, isn't it? But, yeah, so it's just when you were reassured that it weren't a mistake to beat yourself with, really, wasn't it, mate? You were, you were all out of yeah. all the Yeah. Yeah. And it, you have to have standards, don't you? So, yeah. you know, as a winger, you should not miss a tackle, you know, was, was often said. Like, you shouldn't, because, you know, you don't get to make many tackles in a game, really. So you shouldn't ever miss, you know, in in, in comparison to a, a middle unit player who is making however many tackles a game, we can we can let him make two or three, have two or three misses and whatever. You shouldn't, you've got to keep. So if you missed in that fit, or particularly if I missed early on in the game, I'd be like, fuck, what's he going to say to me in that video session tomorrow? Instead of going, mate, you've got 50 minutes of the game left. Like, Go and make some that deal, deal with that. Deal with your miss tomorrow when you've told told everyone else you've scored that trick. You know what I mean? Yeah. That that one miss won't matter. And it's just kind of reframing it in it so that you don't get beat up by it. Because the exposure out on the flanks a bit more obvious, isn't it, than in the middle? Because you've got like yeah. six blocks around you, virtually gang tackling, haven't you? Where if you miss if you miss one when you've jammed in or you miss one when you're like you you two on two and that you're exposed on the flank, aren't you? Yeah, I always compare it to like the goalkeeper in, in the footy game. Yeah. Like a, a centre forward gives the ball away, no one bats an eyelid. Goalkeeper gives the ball away on his goal line. It's a howler. And it, it's yeah. the same with a fullback and a winger in it. Like, but that's the nature of the beast. Like we all sign up to play the same game and that, that just comes with that role. At the same time, those middle units are having to blow out the backside for 40, 50 minutes a game making however many tackles and then have to carry the ball from, you know what I mean? So there's there's pros and cons for every position. It's just, that's the responsibility of playing that in that position. Yeah, the bread and butter stuff. So was, was Union ever an appeal to you, mate, as you got a little bit older? No? No, no, not at all. So we, uh, when I went to uni, actually, there was a, because I went to uni at Loughborough. So like, yeah. there were a lot of like, top, top rugby union players. Um, I actually played, so in my year at Loughborough was Rodri Jones, who's now, what is he now, chief commercial officer within the rugby league. Um, mm-hmm. But there were top, top rugby union players and they said, uh, come, 
with us this weekend. There's a sevens tournament. Come and play sevens. Mate, I got sent off in all three games I played in for giving lip to the ref because oh, yeah. I just didn't get the rules. Yeah. It was like I was tackling people and he was giving a penalty against me. And I'm like, what do you want me to do? And they're like, yeah, let go of him. Tackle him and let go of him. I'm like, yeah, but he can just against get up. Like, yeah. And then I was like grabbing at the ball and I basically got sent off for having tantrums because I just yeah. couldn't. But again, because I was completely naive, thinking, yeah, play the tunnel rugby league. I'm like, do you, do you know I'm signed a witness? Yeah, I'll come and I'll I'll walk on water. Didn't have a clue. It's like <laughs> I'd never seen a round ball. So, yeah. yeah. So, I, I enjoy watching. enjoy watching yeah. particularly the, the international stuff, but it was never, <laughs> never in the cards for me. <laughs> so, do you know when you played the uh, student rep stuff, how how does it go about knowing eligibility? How does selection happen? And talk us through how the tour was when you went down under, mate. Uh, so we uh, the the selection basically you have to have played. Well, it was that long ago now, but you had to have played in a certain percentage of student games, like uh, in the you know normal like university league games, yeah. to then be allowed to like try out. Um, so I had to get permission off John, basically in the club, to be able to play the very bare minimum of games to get to get me through. Now, as it was, and this is like for me the power of particularly rugby league more than anything. So my first day, I actually tell a fib because I was st- I must have still been at St Helens when I first arrived at uni. They must have let me go just after me starting back at uni. Because I turned up in my, in my tracky, we'd played in a game and I'd come straight from the game to go to drop my gear off at uni for the first time. And the guy that was issuing everyone in went, I don't often see one of them badges. What's your story? So I was like, oh, well, I actually play rugby league, play for St. Helens. I've just come from the game. He's like, I'm part of the, the rugby league here. We've never won the champ. We've never won the league. Come down. We, we train on a Thursday night, come down and do some coaching with us. So straight away, as a young kid turning up at uni all on my own, I had a, a family straight away because I walked broke, in. Yeah. yeah, but like, bear in mind, and I'm like, I was walking into these students who were then going, oh my God, he's here. There's that lad from St. Helens oh, he's going in to coach us. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, walking in like 10 men from a lad that really hadn't got any credibility I want to say with at home within the Saints team because I'd never played the amateur game so I hadn't gotten you know built my reputation up I was then yeah. suddenly like 10 men it was it was class yeah. so I got involved then and then they said well you know they're going on tour to us next year we've not won a game would you ever put a shirt on and just play with us so asked John John obviously said look in and around when I can let you play. We'll let you play and we'll see if we can go. So I did that. As it was then, as I say, like Matty Blamar was doing it and at the time. I think he was at Leed, Leeds, I want to say. But there was Jermaine Coleman, Richie Barnett, there was a, a Hull. They were they were all dotting around and they were all that we were all then meeting up at these games, stood on the sideline going, Are you going to play any games to try and get on this Oz tour? They're like, well, yeah, I will if you will. Like, well, yeah. I will, yeah, let's do it. It'll be a good crack. So, so we did it. Um, went away with um, uh, Lee Addison and Vinnie Webb. They were they were leading it, and mate, it was an unreal experience. We went, we were there for a month. Uh, did like the Gold Coast, Townsville, um. It, it was just it was just incredible. We played three tests. I think we played six games in all. But just being away with a like you'll know, kind of just any rugby tour, it bonds you, done it. And particularly like we've just said, really, when Australians come here, the culture shock. Us as students going away to Oz, playing, and I um, I actually ruptured the ligaments in my ankle, um, while we were there strapped it 
and played in the final game and got man of the match. And it, it, it like even to like goosebump moments now, like even to this day, thinking back, it was mega. And yes, it was only, only student rugby, but it was like, it was it was on it was in, un- incredible. It was it was really good. Really enjoyed it. And that again, what that taught me because then. I actually went uh, back to us in the World Cup with Scotland. Um, within, I was actually deemed as like kit man, but it was just to get me on the the flight. Steve McCormack played an absolute blinder to get me there. But <laughs> we visited a lot of the places that we'd visited when I was there as a student. So yeah. I was doing very much the role for in the Scotland camp as I was the witness camp. And suddenly I had like, oh, I know where we can go if we want to do this with the lads. I know where we can go. And if so, it just, it was one of those things, you know, where the universe helps you sometimes because yeah. I hadn't done a lot with the Scottish camp. And then next minute, they're like, fucking hell, how good Sherlock? Like, we've got this problem and he's just gone and solved it down the road by something. <laughs> and it was just because yeah. I'm like, oh my God, I've no, I've been here before. And, I've, and it, it's mad. And it was class being back as well, mate, wasn't it? And just, oh. and then. Make you walk it like the, so. We went um trying to think. I think is it Surface Paradise? Coogee, Coogee Bay it is, and we stayed in the hotel that was next to this nightclub. And now compare this to like even in Liverpool. If a, if St Helens went and stayed in a hotel in Liverpool, and there was a nightclub next door. You wouldn't ever have someone coming up to you going, lads, like, be careful, because if you go next door, the paps will be outside. Like, because no one would have a clue. Mate, no. we turned up at this hotel, the Scottish camp, and they were like, don't, don't, it's not even worth stepping foot in that in that nightclub. Well, nature of the beast. Do, nature <laughs> of the beast, yeah, nature yeah. of the beast, some do. And they're on the front, they're on the, like, the back page of the paper the next morning. Scottish players seen out, and you're like, "What is going on?" They were like, they, "It was like you were you were a Premiership footballer, no matter yeah. what level, you know, which country you were playing for, whether they'd heard of you or they've not. You're playing international rugby league. You are treated like, yeah, it's it's unreal. Okay. It's unreal. It's it's brilliant." Well, before all this happens, mate, you're exposed to the Professional Outfits Academy, aren't you, at Saints, mate? How was that experience? And, and was you okay when it comes to an end? Because you were pretty honest before, and you said, I probably wasn't ready for for anything more yeah. than the audience. So how was that? Was it a good, like, breeding ground for you, mate? Oh, yeah. It taught me a lot very quickly. Yeah. And it taught me a lot about kind of what graft was and like how hard you had to work just to keep up. So, it, you know, and, and the, there were always lads kicking on going up into the first team and you were all, you know, I particularly was often overlooked all the time. Do you know what I mean? Not in a bad way, just because I wasn't good enough. Um, And I think deep down my gut said I wasn't good enough anyway. So when the whole contract thing was coming around, I was preparing my, myself for it anyway yeah but in the back of my mind also always saying well you've had a decent run like you've never played the game really you've had a good couple of years playing here like just take it for what it is do you know what I mean and and you know go away to university and and see what happens what I didn't realize was that kind of the way I'd worked and the way I'd applied myself was then actually what had appealed to John Myler uh, hence why he then he then rang me to say me to witness. Do you know what I mean? So it taught me a lot, but it also bedded in and withstood that, you know, even if you are getting overlooked, if you just keep grafting at some point it'll Attitude it'll come good. Up. Yeah. yeah. Um but I mean it was unreal. Like I was the fact that I could go training and you had a gym. You didn't have to pay for gym membership. Like not only did you have a gym but they got they give you a program and they told you how to lift and they like all of that and the fitness and the health side of it I've always loved. Like I would always be the fittest on the field. That was 
because I just loved it. And the fact that we had someone, we had a, a trainer there uh, called Mick McGurn. Oh, they nicknamed him Irish. And he was like so like scientific and he was, you know, coming off the field and he was giving us electrolyte drinks and he was giving us protein and he was, and it was like, mate, and they're giving us this for free. Like I just, <laughs> I just got to turn up and we're be kid. Yeah, like it was just, it was class. Um, so I, I loved it, and the fact that yes, I'd always been a footballer, but I'd always been to watch the Saints. I'd always gone and watched. So the fact that I was like in the inner workings of it, and yeah. like I'm in the actual changing room where the lads come out, and and all of that was just a buzz for me. So I, I kind of. I was okay when it was coming to an end that like I've yeah. just had a good time and I've been lucky to be here and do it and and whatever. Luckily, I've done some good things and it and it did like kick on. But I mean, I don't want that. I don't want this to sound like Dave Lyon said you're not good enough. And I went, yeah, no problem. I loved it seeing a bit. Like it was like, sake. you know. I think but it's just if you had not give it your, your your shot though, wouldn't it? If you think you'd rested yeah. on your own and thought you'd made it, I think you'd be different, Tim. But because you know you give it what you're at and you fully embraced everything that was going on, it, it only made you not even just a better player, but it definitely enhanced you as a human, didn't it, mate? You've said that oh, before. Oh, 100%. Yeah, 100%. That. 100%. And, like, the the horrible, horrible mornings at Churdley Park in the freezing cold, running up the hill and, and all of that, that kind of stays with you forever. Yeah. But binds you as a group. Like if I ever, ever see Simo out in the middle of St. Helens, it'll I guarantee it'll be the first thing out of his mouth. We're going up for a hill <laughs> run at Shirley. Do you know what I mean? Like it, yeah. it's funny. So, uh, but yeah, like it does teach you a lot about just hard work really. And I think yeah. discipline and manners and representing the, the shirt and appreciating when you're given a plain shirt that actually there's a lot of other people that would have loved to have worn it, but you get to wear it, all of that stuff. And that what we were talking before about the good times at witness, there was always that, like I'm lucky to be wearing this shirt for these people. I'm going to go out and play. And the results didn't necessarily always go the way, but they always appreciated the fact that, they were there and people were paying their hard earned money to go and watch them and yeah. let let's do it. And that's what that's what I like. So how did you find it when you come to witness how was the standard was so was the academy structured in league systems or was it more of a pool thing because it was in its infancy? No, I think it was still leaked. Yeah. When I I think it was a long way back, but it was you know, it was leaked. It was because we was still it similar played. standard then, Tim? Yeah, but the, I think no. But I, now you've said it, we mu- it must have been because I don't ever remember us playing the the top top names. But we right. played like we were playing at Bradford and yeah. places like that. So maybe it was maybe I, mate, you've got me there. I don't know. Sorry, it's, testing the, you. This, <laughs> yeah, I like it. I'm just checking, I've not got Alzheimer's. Trying to get back in there. <laughs> like, um, what that many bangs on the head um yeah. but the standard yeah so when i first started that it was obvious that the standard wasn't as high as it had been at st Helens. like the playing standard but yeah. the standards of what we were what was expected of us were as high because it was john and it like he doesn't care who he's coaching like I'm going to say, imagine that, if it was on it, it would be the same, wouldn't it? Or whoever exactly. It, yeah, yeah. The, this is just what I do. If I, you're playing in my team, this is what I expect of you. Um, and John, in his nature, because he was like that with the team, he was also like that with the club. So you knew he was also battling all the time to get more facilities and get... Because we used to play, we used to train on the field, and I'm rubbish with names, but no opposite the club. What's the, yeah, the big like playing field there? On Lee yeah, King, so we used to, field. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we used to just train there. Yeah. And, you know, having to walk the pitch before we went on it for, for glass and, and stuff. And yeah. yeah, and dog shit. So 
and John was always like trying to improve that and get that better and and you know get us protein for after the game because we you know the money just wasn't there. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. that and he quickly ramped that up. But there was you know it was in his infancy and they were trialing it, but ultimately it paid dividends. Like if you look. You know, it many it's people have done it. Else, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've probably heard it from many different people on here about the players that have been through that academy system and gone on. It's like unreal, isn't it? Yeah. So when when that that call come, mate, after you had to worry about your exam first. What what happens in that next few days? What how do you go about your business? Do you change anything at all? Because it's obviously what you've been doing's worked, hasn't it? Well, yeah, but it's a whirlwind. So, like, yeah. bear in mind, so I'd, whenever, in the pre-seasons, while I'd been away at uni, I'd come back and trained with the first team. And I'd played in a few of the, you know, like, pre-season friendlies. Yeah. But it was always, like, you know, there were shirts with 46, 47, 48, and it was almost like, one lad would come off and you'd put his shirt on and you'd run on almost because there weren't enough first team shirts for the young kids that were having a run. It was like that. And you were always in your, you know, it's it's us four that have got the nod today. So we'll just stick together in the changing rooms and we'll get ready together. And then we'll, when we get thrown on, we'll just do what we have to do and, and play and love it and enjoy it. That is very different because I was coming back into this first team environment and I played at fullback. And they were like, right, go for it. And I can remember going on the field and going, wow, I've got to tell these fellas like, we're to stand in a defensive line. Do you know what I mean? And when, when they're running back, I've got to tell Framey which side of the rook to go and stand on. And do they know who I am? So that learning curve like, was quite steep in a few days because people had actually said in that after my first session, I remember it, I got pulled to one side and they said, mate, you need to open your mouth. What are you doing? I'm like, yeah, I know, but I've got Shane Millard there in the middle of the field. I don't think he knows. He needs me telling him where to go. And they were like, yeah, he does. And so there was that. And then the game itself was on Sky at Salford. Like in that, you like it's got a real dingy changing room at Salford, like, or it was used like, was it the willows, like yeah. you had to, yeah, you had to duck down to sit down in the willows to like to get in, the onion and everything, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, and you came out, you came out like down the a cage <laughs> onto the field, and it was like, oh my god, this is a baptism of fire, like, even pre season games, like. Crowds, you don't get crowds. And now I'm playing on a pitch. I've got a big screen in the corner. Like, what is going on? Um, yeah. It, But that was when I realised this is what I want. This is what I want. And this is what I'm meant to be. Because the buzz, mate, was, was, like, was unreal. It was the, the thrill of playing in front of those people. Oh, it was just mega. It was mega. It was class. Do you remember much about the game, sir? Uh, no, only that Fitzy, uh, Carl Fitzpatrick, scored past me by skipping over. He came through the line and he skipped over and I got round him, round him, and he just managed to get over the line and he's never, ever let me live it down. Um, <laughs> that's about it. Other than, sounds silly, other than the raw. Yeah. Um, because we, we won as well. And, yeah, it was the roar after the game and, and like, running over to the fans after the game to kind of, as, as we always used to do, to say thanks and all that jazz. Like, that feeling afterwards, the actual game's a blur, but probably because I was just panicking and chasing my tail for the whole time. But, so what's yeah. it like, mate, when you're walking and your name's on the back of a jersey, young go, what does that mean well, to you? Sorry, well, that's where I was going. So, pre-season, yeah. when I was saying about 46, 47, yeah, yeah. seeing your name on a shirt with a squad number, you know, like, like, that's, that's my your... number. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it was it was 33. It, like, that's how, you know, 
they were scraping the barrel. They must have been really struggling. If they'd hit 33 and they still needed to ring me, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they were scraping. But it was the fact that no one else is having that. No one else has got that number this year. No one else is yeah. going to have it. And even sounds silly. So then um, a couple of years after, obviously, you, you would always expect to move up in squad numbers. When other lads came and played in an, in that 33, in the back of my head, I was like, I'm not sure that. Yeah, like, do it just do you realise what, yeah. what number you're putting on your back? And it's stupid, isn't it? It was 33. Oh, like, it was the bottom yeah, of the barrel. Really? But, but it was the shirt that I'd made my debut in, my pro debut in, and it was like, to yeah, keep it. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I've got any any of the shirts I got given, I've kept bar my very first uh, St. Helens shirt, which I actually buried with my grandpa because he was a massive Saint, uh, massive Saint supporter. And when I got signed there, he, was, he loved it. So I buried that with him. Uh, but other than that, yeah, I've got them all. Oh, yeah, that's... And my missus goes mad because, like, they're just in a box in the top of the garage. You know what I mean? Like... Collecting You've gone stuff, on, really. yeah. yeah. But I've never part with them because that's the that's the it's kind of the medal in it that shows that yeah. it was worth it's it. The memories, yeah. mate. They they, they kickstart memories, don't they? And... Well, yeah, and and so uh, you know what when we were going before about the little things and the little efforts with first team players. So I would always make a big thing with first team players about uh, if they made 100 games, if they made 200 games, if it was, uh, you know, whatever it was, that they should keep their shirt. And I battled for many, many years to get it. So the point that I had to be running here, there and everywhere, the day before games, even on the morning of some games, to just try and get a little bit of embroidery on a shirt. And people within the club were like, what are you like? Do you know how much a first team shirt is? Like you can't just be doing giving out like 10, 12 shirts a, a you know a year just because that player's made so many games. I'm like, but you don't understand unless you've done it and played in it and got that, like, you don't understand what that means to a player to then be able to keep that shirt. And so I would always like even to the point that I go into my own pocket to pay for things and pay for shirts because well, I've done it making sure that player had that experience. If he's played 200, you know, professional games mm-hmm. within the that modern made, era, yeah. it's mega and that should yeah. be rewarded. And the fact that he'll walk away with that shirt sounds silly to some, but I know to the player would mean a lot. So, yeah. yeah. No, I don't know. It, you know that, that I'm quite what what That's what I'll be doing. I'll be doing, like, keeping stuff and that. So it's nice yeah. to wear it. You know. So how did that year go then, mate, after that debut? So that year was pretty good. Yeah. Like, I love that year. Like, to the, in the sense of, so when I say it was pretty good, we um, we had to fight to stay up into Super League. And there was a game at, uh, at Witness against Huddersfield. And in the last minute of the game, I attacked. I think it was St. Hilaire, I want to say, right in the corner. And it was like a do or die last ditch tackle to, to save it. Had he say had he had scored that, they'd have won the game. And that would have put us into the drop. So I'd felt like I'd contributed, do you know what I mean? I'd 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 massively made an impact on that. Um then the last game of the season. We play. I can't. Do you know how bad this is? I can't remember who we played, but um, it was up between us and Cass as to who was going to go down, and they did right. it via they they showed our game on the telly, but they had the Cass game playing on the big screen at the ground. So we were playing in the match and seeing every time that Cass scored on the big yeah, screen. Yeah, oh, it was. It, it was, but it was exciting. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It was. It was, and then so obviously we. The results we won. The results went our way. Cast lost or whatever. We stayed up. That that was like, mate. It was like we'd won the league. It was epic. Yeah. It was unbelievable. And um, and so that was like the first year to do it. it. Was like, oh my god, this is what it's like to be a pro player. This is mega. 
And then we went away on Mad Monday to Dublin and got stuck in Dublin. And oh, mate, yeah. unreal. <laughs> so, when a team's as close as like we like to think they are, mate, so I know we've touched on them roles that you've had, that the role you've done are key in pulling that unit together. But a team's as, as close as we want to think they are. Some are. Yeah. Some are. Um, on the flip side, some aren't. Yeah. Um, and the You've year... You've seen both then, yeah. Yeah, I've seen both. So that yeah. first year, that first year when I came in, it was like the, every, every player in that changing room would have died for each other, like on and off yeah. the field. Fast forward that, maybe one or two years, and there was definite then divides coming. And you can probably mirror that to like the way results went and the way the club went a little bit. Um, I don't, you know, I, I'm not saying it was anyone's fault, coach, owner, players, I, you know. But there was a divide. Yeah. You know, everyone can play a game with each other, but off the field, the bitching and the moaning behind people's backs, etc. But I mean, there's many examples in sport, aren't there, of teams that have been like that and then could still produce it on the field. But at Witness, it just, it, I, I think that was some of it. Um, but w- there was no doubt when the team was in it together, even when the results were going badly, like we said before we started this, like the best times for me at Widness were when that camp was gelled. Results did what results did, but everyone knew we were all working our balls off to win every week. And just that, being in that together was, is like, yeah, it's gold. Because you know when you're in it. Because yeah. you also know how bad it is when you're not. Do you know what I mean? And you can't ever. You just wish you could bottle it, and it and its personalities, and it's getting the right personalities in the room that blend together and and, and meet on common ground, etc. And takes work. Like, um, one of the best people I've I've seen for it was uh, Chris Houston in more recent years because it was so important to him that that changing room was together and he put so much effort in a, like away from the club to bring the lads together, organise barbecues. So there was him, there was Hep, there was Graf, there was uh, Charles, Charles Runciman, uh, Jack Buchanan. You know, they would all make that big thing of, you know, we're a family here. Many of us have come from Australia and haven't got our extended family. So you are our extended family, and let's let's be in this together. And though yeah. you know they were the, they're the memories. Do you know what I mean? They're the, they're the when you know you've got that good group, that good core. So, what what was the early retirement about, mate? How did that come about? And was it a game injury? Was it a training injury? It was game injury. Um, game injury played in a uh, Mike Gregory testimonial game uh, in the Mike Gregory testimonial game and was dropped on my head basically or a tackle that ended up with me going on my head um, but I I would always get whacked around the head I, was all, I would forever you know take a high shot I think it was the way I, I went into collision I would always be quite upright so I would always take a high shot and it worked in my favour many times because I would often get penalties for the team because of it. Do you know what I mean? But anyway, this one tackle dropped on my head, came up fuzzy, felt groggy, but it was like any other tackle. Um, played the game, finished the game. Um, the next day at training, I had to get a lift into training because I couldn't drive because I just didn't feel right. So I got a lift into training thinking it'll it'll wear off, it'll shrug off. Did a we did a like a stretching thing on the pitch. Still hadn't gone, went into the change room afterwards, said to the team doc, mate, something isn't right. Can you just give me a check over? Within ten minutes, he had me on a spinal board, strapped up, straight to sent to the hospital. 
uh, with a suspected fractured neck, broken neck. Now, the story actually gets even more fandangled in the sense that they got me to the hospital, x-rayed me and said, yeah, you're fine, no problem. Actually, I, we don't know what's up, but you're fine to go home. So I went home, and at half past six the following morning, my phone was ringing off the hook with the hospital, saying, uh, sorry, sir, we'd actually mixed up your x-rays. The neck is fractured. You need to get safely back to hospital ASAP. Um, so that was that. So, yeah, I, I had eventually broken my neck. <laughs> It was yeah. confirmed, and that was the problem. But um, the actual break wasn't the issue. The issue had damaged uh, the vertebral artery and several nerves in my arm, and they, they basically put it down to, um, you know, like if you've got an elastic band and you stretch it, but you overstretch it, and it doesn't actually ever recoil and go back to the shape. Yeah. You know, layman's terms, that's what I'd done to all the arteries in my neck. Um so they advised that I stop playing. Now, I didn't. I, I said I wanted to get back fit. So I trained then. The club luckily said, well, all right, we'll give you the chance to do it. So I trained. It was about seven or eight months of rehab. Um, and it was a lot because my because of the nerve damage, I'd lost my vestibular system, which is like the balance system in your body. So I couldn't balance I couldn't, um, when it first kicked off, and all the lads used to laugh at me, I couldn't, like, sit on the front seat of a team bus in the rain because the wipers of the bus would just send me wow. all over the place, like, dizzy and awful. But at the same, if I took a bang or a whack or anything, and I mean if I was stood up and someone shoved me, my body couldn't recalibrate itself. So in order to get fit, I've obviously got to get whacked, haven't I, yeah. to get to get to train it. So the only way to do that at the time, Barry and Tez were actually injured when I was injured. And I can remember to this, and if you ask them, like Tez will talk about this, the session was basically, here's the ball, Sherlock, run five yards into Tez and Baz, who are on shields, and let's see how you do. And everyone was like a um, car crash that I wouldn't, I couldn't get up. I'd be on the deck. It would take me ages to get up. And I'd be like, right, I've just got to go again. We've just got to get this. I've just got to kick start. So it was a long road. Anyway, got back fit, got back to, you know, ready to go. Uh, and they they played me in uh, two academy games to get my fitness back up and under 21s it was at the time um, played at Hull KR I want to say and played in the centre so yeah. as I was saying when I get grey and old I'd, I'd have moved out to the centre didn't re like came on in second half for the last 10 minutes basically let's drop him in slow we're not 100% sure he's going to be okay let's just drip him in and played did okay uh, yeah. actually I think I came on and I think we ended up winning the game and I put, you know, put them through to score for the for the two tries. I was like, walked off buzzing like, yeah, see, first team are dropping down 21. not played in nine months. <laughs> Look at me. Following week, went to Halifax and I started the game at full whack. And I can remember this bit clear as day. We uh, kicked the ball last tackle and I chased the ball. Their fullback caught it and I tackled him, and someone came in, second man, and hit the back of my head, and as he hit my head, everything went, and I fucking, I knew it. Yeah. So, it, I've gone down, and at this point, I know, I've, I've retreated now, and I've watched this back several times, it took me the full set to get back. So you, you can tell how groggy I was. They've then kicked the ball up on the last tackle, and I'm stood like this, ready to catch it. And the ball's bounced 20, 30, 40 metres away from me. Like, just nowhere near me. Like, not not like I've miscaught it. Like, yeah. I, they've kicked the ball from their 40. 
I'm stood on our 20 meter line. Like it's not even like a drop. It's nowhere near. So I've then run over to grab the ball. And as it's bouncing around, I've grabbed it and I've just kept running and I've run off the field, off the touchline and collapsed off the touchline. And at that point, like we knew it was it was game over. And from there, then I was actually, and what I'd done was flared everything up again with the nerves and the artery and et cetera, et cetera. And was then in hospital for six weeks and lost about about four stone um was being ferried by ambulance to london and back to try and get the right doctors to to get me sorted um and talking to people at the time like there were several people that said because the team actually came to visit me in the hospital um as a group and apparently many of them had walked out going potentially could be the last time we've seen him and I know that sounds really but because I'd lost so much weight so quickly yeah. I couldn't I couldn't really function they were like that that could be show up like yeah. um and so then that was that was the end of that one retirement came and yeah. um, you don't mind yeah. me asking mate it's just a few things so was it a bit easier to accept like we said before because you give it everything you you had You've done everything right. You've been meticulous. You've been patient. Yeah. You've run two of the biggest players the club had at the time, several times. So it might have took your time, but you've got up and had another go. Was it a little bit easier to accept or still difficult? I think, um, yeah, I think you, you're right in the sense of I couldn't really argue. Do you know what I mean? At like at that point, like I knew that they'd said give up first time and I hadn't. And I knew I'd, you know, yeah, like you say, I'd given it everything. I still and still to this day feel it you know, it wasn't on my terms. I didn't choose to, some like I had to. Um yeah. and that that's the bit like you've probably noticed from the way I talk and the stories you've heard of me, I'm quite, I like to be in control. I like, I like to have everything right. I like to have my, the fact that I couldn't, yeah. at least when I was playing, I may not have been picked every week. I knew I was kind of, it was in my control still to get better and to get picked. Now I had no chance. Yeah. And it wasn't me saying I give up. It was because people were basically saying, you can't come over this white line to play the game anymore because you're not well enough, yeah. and it it was yeah it was it it, it was it was hideous it was it it really was hideous and again because of the the whole identity stuff like we've like we were saying before about school like sport was my safe place and I can't do it like I can't so who am I who are my mates now who what am I gonna do Watch your Monday to Friday and yeah. Yeah. Like um yeah, like when you walk in a room, no one's gonna want to talk to me anymore. Cause I used to walk in a room and everyone say, Oh, it's Tim that plays a witness. Now it's for a first bit, it was t- he, Tim, you know, a lad that had to retire with his neck. It was even yeah. worse. Like people now knew me because of an injury, like it, it yeah. No, I so, like, well, yeah, yeah, I get it, mate. I do get it. Not to that extent, because I'm only an amateur and that, but yeah, you, you, your world, like, it only takes a second for your world to go upside down, doesn't it? Yeah. But yeah. you say I was like, not to your extent, because I was only an amateur. Like, that, for me, it's no different. Yeah. You loved playing as much as I love playing. Granted, yeah. I got paid for it and you maybe didn't, but you still love doing it. And now yeah. you suddenly can't do it because you got hurt. It, yeah. It's and nothing like I think it, yeah. that's it. So I think that initial gut feeling of the realization of not being able to do it is the, like a is the same. We yeah. all have that passion to play. That's why we play it. Do you know what I mean? You no, know, if you wrote it down on a piece of paper, 
of what the sport is, going flying around into a man that wants to hurt you. We don't want to do it, would they? But we do it because we love it. And that's the, it, yeah. And yeah, I'll do it again. Yeah. 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 So, and, and obviously, mate, because of how unwell you was after it, are you aware of what your mindset was? Like, are you aware of how you were behaving or coping or was you coping? No, I wasn't coping. No, I wasn't coping at all. Um, I the the physio at the time uh, was a girl called Becky Hodkiss. Um, she basically became like my living carer, in the sense of um, she was by the hospital bed as much as she could, yeah, not to do anything other than just to be sit there. and be there. Um, and then when I came out of hospital, I actually, um, so when I came out of hospital, my, so bear in mind, I came out of hospital, I'm, I'm virtually bed, but like, I hate saying this now, like, pe- like people didn't know this. No one really knew it. So I was, I was basically bed bound. Every time I ate anything, because my vestibular system was so messed up, I, my body couldn't cope with even food coming in. So I was being sick. So I couldn't keep calories in. That, I was dizzy anyway. So I, then the lack of food was making everything worse. They couldn't they couldn't keep get my body to accept food. Um, they couldn't. So, so I was I was in a bad, bad way. And this this sounds really bad on the minute I made them go. My mum and dad at the time. So I actually so I came out of hospital and I had to move back in with my mum and dad. Like there was no option. I couldn't care for myself. I could I couldn't. And they planned a once in a lifetime trip to Australia for six weeks or whatever. And I was like, go. And they were like, they my mum didn't want to go because she didn't think when she came back I'd, you know, she didn't know what had happened while so the the team doctor, this is unheard of. No one would ever do this. Even then, yeah. I don't even think they'd do, but they definitely wouldn't do it now. The team doctor, Paul Stockton, actually moved me into his house and I stayed with him um, for that period. And I, looking back now, you realise, yes, it was to look after me, but it was also because of my mental state and they didn't trust me on my own. You now know that yeah. you don't see it at the time. You, it's just, but that's what it was. That one hundred percent what it was because that was yeah. But it's identity, and that you don't. You've lost to me. I'd lost my identity in in no time because even when I first got hurt and I was rehabbing back, it was like the hero story of. Yeah, I've had this horrendous injury, but I'm going to be back playing and come and look at me. And I've, but still now, still got a badge on your chest, still rocking up to the same facility with the same people. Yeah. yeah. But now, well, I've been telling everyone for the last seven months that, or however long that I'm going to get back fit and play. And I've basically failed. So there's that as well on top of it. Do you know what I mean? It's, it, yeah, it was tough. It was really tough. Um, and, you know, Steve McCormack uh, and Andy Haig, who were head coach and strength and conditioner there at the time, were unreal because they they just basically, again, as I'm now getting more healthy, as in come walk and talk and move around and get into the club day to day, they were like, if you can get in, you get in. We don't know what that looks like come in and be, you know, stand around with us as coaches, but you've effectively got months, you know, this year left on your contract. You honour your contract and you get into the club. And they weren't doing that to be horrible and say I needed to earn my money. They were doing that to say you're part of this group and you, you you know, you're in it right to the end. Yeah. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. from there, that then progresses because then I'm in at the club and I'm stood around doing nothing. So then I'm going over to the community department and I'm saying, like, where are you going today? Oh, I'll I'll jump in with you this afternoon and I'll come to that school. And that then progressed 
So then the year after, when my playing contract had finished, they said, well, we can give you a contract in the community staff if you want to do that. And it just yeah. then snowballed and snowballed and snowballed. So I'd, I'd never actually left the team. I just then Roll bounced on to all the, the different roles within the, within the club. Which I mean, totally t- saved t- me. Being honest, though, mate, I appreciate that. And I'm sorry to have put it on you. That weren't obviously what I sent you, but... Yeah, no, no. Nice, mate. It's no, it's it, it, it it's tough in it, and it's yeah, you know, and I think sometimes outside world supporters don't necessarily see the graft and the dedication that lads put in, and that you know, from when I then went into the, the welfare and the, the strength and conditioning side of the club coach and players, that was the bit that would always grate on me. That, you know, yes, we all know that there were some players, you know, that would turn up. And I don't mean a witness. I mean, anywhere there's players that turn up and just get a paycheck and it means nothing. There's also a lot of lads that do everything they can and sometimes it just doesn't go right for them. And then players get on the Yeah, and Speckies get on the back. And that would great because you like you don't know the damage because that lad's given everything. Yeah, he's yeah. not playing well, but you don't know what it means to him. And, no. uh, and yeah. you do because you've helped build that environment. And then when your career's suddenly come to an end in that fashion, that environment's also caught you and helped you. Yeah, and that's what you're about before. It's about the buying, and because you've all bought it. And it was your safety net, wasn't it? I know some of them That's had it. to walk away because of the they were worried or how you look, but they still turned up when you needed them most, didn't they? Hundred percent, hundred percent. So yeah, I remember because that year was the year of. Were they in? Did we get into the the last? It was I think it was the time there was the last game, you know, to see who got up the two teams yeah. that played. Can't remember the format. And it was the big final, and I was still in hospital at this point. And they, Steve McCormack, was adamant that I was at that game. So they actually got my mum and dad came and picked me up from the hospital, took me to the game, and I had a, I had all sorts of wires and drips connected to me. But Steve also ensured that I had a club suit to turn up to that all the rest of the lads had, and I sat and watched the game. And then they had to take me straight back to hospital that night after the game. But he made sure I was there to watch it. And it's little efforts like that that no one else knew had gone on. No one else knew he'd done that. Steve had probably had to argue with an awful lot of people to make it happen. It only happened because the club doctor at Witness also worked at the hospital I was in. So he could pull a few strings as well. And like they didn't need to do that. Yeah. But it meant a lot to me to be there at that game with, with the lads as part of it. So, yeah, like you say, like that buying and that group, that's what you you do it for because that they do it for you back. Yeah, and you more than replicated that in your future endeavours within our organisation meeting, yeah? Well, I'd like to think so. Yeah. And like even, you know, now to this day, if certain people ever ring me and say, mate, can you give us a lift with this? I will do it 100% like unequivocally because of what people have done for me in the past. You know? Yeah. So when when your time at the club comes to an end, mate, uh, was it something you were okay with? Was it something shitty? Was it was it okay? When I finished at the club? Yeah. Like, oh, as, no, I as wasn't okay general. with it. No, no. Oh, no, I wasn't okay with it. No, yeah. that was very different. So that was very different. So not finishing playing was you know devastated gutted yeah when i left the club it was anger it was yeah no it no I, it just wasn't the worst that you'd you'd seen and been a part of i imagine then mate the change was yeah it wasn't the 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 results had the the club trying to think of a way of putting this down the club wasn't in the state that I believed it it 
should have been in or could have been in. And it certainly it wasn't certainly wasn't representing the town like I thought it could. It's probably the best way of putting it. Um and, and how you how you guys had as well in the recent past, isn't it? Just off what yeah. we've thought. Yeah. Yeah, and like bear in mind, like results the the team were never like up there and, and probably, you know, spectators were still saying, you know, it's nothing like the good old days and it mm. and you know, there's that side of it. But that didn't for me and, and, and I think it's really important, like that I think the rugby club within Widness is the heartbeat of the town. And like we were talking before about the, the WIDs and the, the the partnership that they had a few years ago. Like if that club is is right and is beating, I think everything in the town kicks on. I yeah. think mood in the town, morale in the town, companies oh, are then companies are then wanting to sponsor the club because the club's thriving, but that actually makes the companies thrive and there's a business you know, there's so many kick on effects. Yeah. And that wasn't happening. And even when the team weren't at the top of Super League or were fighting to stay in Super League or whatever, that beat was still there. People were still going into work excited about talking about the game not just going in moaning and bitching and complaining about how this had happened and they'd been ripped off by this and they see the crowd and it was just it had all just turned sour oh, um, and to some extent I think that, that could have been me personally as well I think that could have just been like the years and the toll and the what had gone on, Matt, Matt could have just, when I say me, like that could just be my perception. You know, if you talk to someone else, they said, oh, maybe it wasn't that bad, you know. And it, and because of that, I did, my, me and my missus were both at the club at the same time. And we both were finished, let go, walked away, whatever, whatever, whoever you talk yeah. to. Whatever different people story. want to know. Yeah. Um, but we both left the club at the same time. So we were then a family that had no one in the job earning. Yeah. But I think it came at a time like we just, we'd had Frankie, we hadn't had our little boy yet, but I was realising that I'm putting every single ounce into this club. I'd, I'd be in there at six o'clock, be working through till eight, half eight at night. I'd be coming home, then taking calls all night. It was I lived and breathed it, not going on holidays, not doing all of this. But I'm missing out now. I've got a little girl. This could be my time to step away now. This, you know, life could be, we're at that junction. And the way this has gone and the way I'm feeling about it, it could be the right time to step away. When I did, though, I then went back into that mad depression big way in a big big way because he, I was Mr Witness I was I was Sherlock I walked around town and everyone would know me as you know being involved at the club yeah. now I'm not and it that was like oh my god what do I do what yeah. do I do like I don't know anything else don't know anything else don't know any other work don't know any other sets of people my mates from school, basically accepted that I lived and breathed my job and my work. So I didn't really have a social network going out with them. It was like, oh my God, crumble. Like, the same, it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so th- and at that point, that was that that was difficult as well. That was a, a just to pick yourself up again. Like, but you do because that's just what sports taught you. But it, it was, yeah, it was tough. So what, what's Tim been doing since since that, mate? What What is now Tim? Oh, my God, so much. So much. <laughs> so much. From um, the factory warehouse work, uh, picking and packing, to uh, I worked with, I worked in a non, not-for-profit uh, company for a little bit. 
I what else have I done? And then more recently, what I've been doing more recently is car importing and exporting globally around the world. Um, so a whole array of things. Yeah. Nothing's changed then, really, but, has it? No, but yeah. but that's it. That's always been my life. And it, you know, I, I'd set up a, a, a converted my garage into a gym. And was training, you know, a few rugby lads, a few boxers yeah. um out of there. Um it's the 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 buzz and the banter though of being within a, a club and working with players and doing that kind of welfare piece alongside the training just hadn't ever been found. I hadn't found that that same passion for it. Um, hence why I'm now looking at doing something along those lines, yeah. kind of moving forward. Because like we've said, I think there's a gap there of support for people. And ultimately, it's what I'm passionate about and what I feel I can help with. So that that's where we're going in the future. Uh, but yeah, I've done, done everything and anything. I think you'd be a credit to an organisation, mate. You can't train the skills you've had through what you've had to do. That's just not in a yeah. textbook. That's just life, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and it's it's kind of it's teaching just teaching just how to be, how to live life, like how to how to be in an organization and and represent the organization. I think it's often missed. Like the so many people you hear just turn up to work to just get paid. Whereas I don't think you ever get that with anyone. And I don't mean just professional sportsmen, people that have been ingrained like you with the WIDs. You know what it means to represent the WIDs. Yeah. And you don't just do that at the WIDs. That's part of who you are. So you'll go into your work and yeah. represent that work. And it, it's funny. Like, there's a, so I've heard a story recently and it kind of sums it up. There's a current player, and people might connect the dots, but there's a current player playing part time who's training to be uh, an electrician. And there were on a Friday Friday afternoon at four thirty, there was a guy stuck on a job, and all the lads basically said it's four thirty on a Friday. I'm not getting involved in that. Off I go. He was the the player was the one person that turned around, turned up at this and stayed there like late in the night to get this lad over the line and get this job finished on a Friday afternoon. And all the big bosses are, are like ringing him and going, mate, I can't believe you did that. I, like, it was unbelievable effort. And his response was like, what What? What do you mean? He rang me because he needed help, so I've gone and helped him. Like, just trust what you're doing it. Yeah. It's just what you do in it, and it's just on. So I think bringing that out in in sports lads to realise, like any organisation would love you in there because you've got this mentality, and yeah. then and and teach them how to show it really and and try. But basically, doing the player welfare for players that aren't within a rugby club basically yeah. is in a nutshell what it is. No, no, yeah. I can't imagine it's not going to take off. I can't because it, everything we do is transferable. Leadership, no. communication, body language, techniques, dealing with different characters, types of characters, shapes, sizes, everything about it all works in every walk of life. Oh, it's 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 mad. Like, so my, the, when I was talking about the car exporting, so the company was a Canadian company. Uh, that dealt a lot with Nigeria in Nigeria, but the Canadians couldn't wrap their heads around people on the on on the phone in Nigeria that were just saying, "Yeah, yeah, I'll send you money, like whenever, I'll just get it to you." They were like, "No, we need paying, and we need paying now." Yeah. Like, don't get it. So I got on a call. I was like, "This is just like talking to the lads. Like, this is just what you do." So I got on and ended up giving him a bit of shit but like in a, a jokey way like come on lad are you ever gonna like get up off your backside and go and pay that check it built that rapport next minute they're all paying bang on time 
But again, because what the Canadians hadn't accepted was actually the way the Nigerians do business is slightly different. And yeah. there's, you know, there were, there were other loops and, and ways and bits of paperwork that they needed that the Canadians just didn't think, you know, oh, yeah, they're asking for that, but it's not important. We've come connect but with going it. that extra little bit and going, well, yeah, I can get you that paperwork or I can get you that extra bit of pictures or that extra bit of whatever. But can you make sure you get that money in tomorrow for me? Suddenly we've got that relationship and boom. But it was just like like you would in the changing room with a lad that w- doesn't want to do a community appearance. Like it, it's exactly the same. Exactly. So yeah. I think it's, yeah, I do think sport ingrained a lot in you. Yeah. Right, a few tough questions for you, Tiff. Go for it. So, any pre-match superstitions, mate, when you were putting the boots on? Uh, stop panicking. Stop panicking. Stop panicking. No. <laughs> um, pre-match superstition. No, not not getting not getting dressed. But uh, boots had to be cleaned and wiped in a particular way before I put them in the bag to go to the, the game. And I would also have to go and find a local field and catch and kick 50 bombs the night before a game, every game, no matter what. Right. No, yeah, it's, that's mad, isn't it? Really? Had to be 50. Had to be 50. Had yeah. to be 50. And, that, and the last 10 had to be caught consecutively perfectly or we started again. Start again. <laughs> yeah. So the, the definition in this next word makes different for everybody, but the toughest player you played with and the toughest player you played against. Toughest player I played with. Julian O'Neill, the prop. Just nails. Yeah. Just nails. I mean, there's there's, there's there's many, but he was just nails because the years he played and the the carnage he took on his body, and he just never complained. He just rocked up and did it again. Do you know what I mean? You'd be looking at him thinking, "Are you never going to play at the weekend?" And he just turn up and do it. So that's who I've played with. Toughest player I've played against. Um. Do you know who? Do you know what I'm going to say? Um, Martin Moana played Fox. played Halifax. Um, as uh, coming up through the ranks, playing on the 21s level and reserves level, he would often drop down because he was that always injured and whatever. And I can just remember him handing me my backside a couple of times, you know, like I'm this old man and I'm gonna (laughs) teach and I'm gonna teach you young pups how to do how to play because I can't really be bothered being here in this game. I've just got to do it to prove my fitness. And that like that that stands out him handing me my backside. When when we played first team it was all they were just all hard and tough and you know what I mean it was just what it was but he stood out as like oh my God. Yeah. It's on. Yeah. Because there were no limit to the older players then, mate, was there? If they yeah. had dirt in first team as coming back, they could play, couldn't they? Yeah, that's it. You could just play them. And it, it was, it really was like this season, you know, almost with the fag in his mouth. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'll do this and I'll do yeah. that. And you think you're clever, do you? Well, I'll teach you. It was almost yeah, okay. like that. So your favourite away ground, mate, that you've played at? St. Helens. Norsley Road. Nosley Road. Like right, the Nosley older ground. Yeah. Yeah. And just, yeah, just for the no- nostalgia, I think. Yeah. Like, um, I enjoyed playing it, to be fair, we saying that, I enjoyed playing it, uh, the DW as well. And, but I think, again, that's the kid in me coming out, like the Saints Wigan rivalry. It was like, oh my God, I've really made it if I'm playing in the first team game here. Do you know what I mean? I think. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Right, mate. Yeah. If you could go back and tell a younger Sherlock something, what would it be? Well, we've touched on it. 
it doesn't matter. Yeah, just enjoy it, it. it. Basically, it doesn't matter. Um, just try and play without the pressure on your shoulders. Just go and enjoy it. Like, what will be, will be. The game will finish at the same time, whether you're panicking the whole time or you're enjoying it the whole time. So just go, go and play. Right, mate. And when you've been out with the lads and you've had a few and the microphone ended up in your hand, what, what would you give us? Oh, uh, God, there's, there's, there's been a fair few. Um, the, there's a few, too, too many. I couldn't, I couldn't pull you one out. Um, sex on fire was always a favorite. Yeah, get people going. That I imagine, mate. Um, but yes, there's. I've, I'm, I'm known as a, I can be a bit of a show off when, when I've had a few pints. So there's, right. there's a, there's been a fair few performances in the past. Yes, <laughs> yes. And if you're willing to, mate, a one to thirteen that you've been involved with. I can tell you for an you know easy start, it would be David Peachy at fullback because right. mate, just watching him on a field was like poetry oh, in really? motion. Yeah, like the hysteria around when we signed him as well, and oh. turning to him come when we got relegated because he'd stayed yeah. on the but they had to let him go, sort of thing. But yeah, yeah, oh, just just unbelievable. Yeah. 